With the MAC tournament on the horizon for both men's and women's soccer, both teams gear up for postseason action and it's almost time to break down our final MAC standings for the men's team. Plus, we hit the ice and discuss who the most valuable player for the women's ice hockey team is. All this and more on a new episode of Bobcat Breakdown starting right now. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Studio 125 for another episode of Bobcat Breakdown. I'm Anthony Rossi and I'll be your gracious host for the evening. Alongside me we have a co-worker of mine on the Women's Hockey Beat reporting staff, David Klepfer, and executive producer for this very show, Connor Core. How's it going guys? Feeling good. I'm glad to be up here with you guys. Connor, I hate to say it, but you're going down, bud. Well, you know, there's a first time for everything and losing is not the first time for me, but we'll see what happens. Hopefully to get the win, but it's also the first time for you on desk, so welcome to Q3 Sports Department. I appreciate All it. Right. Appreciate you having being here with me. Let's get right into the debate, gentlemen, and remember, no holding back. Yesterday really got me into the Halloween spirit, but the women's soccer team has their semifinal match against Canisius on Thursday. So with all that in mind, is this matchup for the Bobcats a trick or, or a treat? Connor, your experience with this team, we'll start with you. Yeah, looking at this game, you know, looking at the regular season matchup, it kind of reminded me a lot of the the candy Halloween theme. I think it's a good way to start it off. It reminded mm -hmm. me of the the candies Bean Boozled, where you know it's very similar. You know, could be could be a blue, but it could be you know blueberry. It could also be blue, but also could be just absolute you know not good in the mouth by all means. So this could be a win for this Bobcats team, or it could be a little bit might might be a little bit of an issue. You know, they tied, Kanisha's tied 10 games this season, and their largest margin of victory or loss was three games in the win over St. Peter's. Now, the, Kanisha's beat Ryder in PKs this past Sunday, and will be traveling over 1,000 miles in three days. That's a lot of miles to travel in, in, the, in the bus, and coming back to Hamden, it's going to be a lot different for this Bobcat squad. You know, going into... You know, playing at home, they're two completely different teams at home and away, and I think this is going to be a, a little bit of a treat for the Bobcats heading into the MAC championship game. Well, you're saying this is going to be a little bit of a treat. I think it's going to be just a complete treat. You know, Rebecca Cook, absolute weapon. She got the golden boot for a reason. Yeah. Um, Quinnipiac is looking strong in this with 10 players on 2022 all MAC teams, the most out of any school. Q has already beat Canisius once this year, so there's, you know, they have that confidence going in. And on top of that, Q hasn't lost to Canisius since 2014. And in a look at the history since 2008, there's been a combined score of 23-7 to 7 in favor of yeah. QU. So I just, I don't even think it's going to be a game. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very dominating and very good stats. I appreciate you pulling up those stats on the first question right there. But, you know, Dave Clark has said it multiple times that it was a, probably the best case scenario for them to go to Canisius and win that tough 1-0 win. And when you come back at home, like you've mentioned, they've absolutely dominated 23-7 to in the goal differentials and haven't lost to Canisius since 2014. I think it will be a treat, but, you know, he mentions it when he talks about Niagara and Canisius. They always have, like, this blue-collar type of feel with each team. It's going to be a very physical game, and if, I think if Canisius can kind of slow them down and, you know, make them play out of their game, I think it could be a little bit closer for a game, but I still do see Quinnipiac winning. This may not be as big of a blowout as some may assume, and I hope I'm wrong, to be honest with you. So, Yeah, I agree with both of you. I think that this game is going to be a treat for the Bobcats. Um, staying on women's soccer for a moment, how far do you think that they will get during this playoff run and possibly beyond that? Connor, you started last time, so David, we'll go with you. Knock it off. Well, I think they're going to make it to about the second round of the NCAA tournament. This team is good. They will, I don't think they'll have much of a problem in the MAC. There's really not many holes in this team. Now, Connor, I know you said that you think their biggest weakness is the midfield, but out of the, ten Bob, out of the seven Bobcats on MAC first team, Three of them are the midfield. Mm -hmm. It's more than any other position on first team overall. Now, it isn't even split down 3-3-3 three, three, three with one goalie. Yeah. But when we're looking at you know, where they're placing first, second, third, first is, first is midfield. 
You know, I was going to say that this is going to be a hot take that Quinnipiac will still be playing when it comes to the second round of the NCAA championship, but I guess it's not a hot take if you and I are both agreeing on the fact that, you know, they will be playing in that second weekend of the NCAA tournament. You know, this team will end up winning the MAC championship. They just have to, like I said, find a way to win against Canisius with that blue collar team. They'll be playing the winner of Niagara and Fairfield, but they have to do three big things. I feel like they have to play through Olivia Scott and Courtney Chokel. We've seen many times in many packages by B reporters and people uh, throughout the team. And Olivia Scott basically creates every single goal that happens. And Courtney Chokel kind of just like gets the recognition for it because she has 13 assists and tied as one of the top people in the nation for assists. They have to also stop. Don't try being a hero. This is the first time that every single player on this team is this, and this will be the first home MAC championship game for the women's soccer team. So they have to make sure to stay to who they are throughout this entire season to get up to this point. And they also have to don't let the opponent dictate the flow of the game. You know, in the home opener against Niagara, they, you know, it was 0 0 going into halftime. And that red card that sent Niagara down to 10 players throughout the rest of the game, and that PK in that game as well, kind of set the tone for the rest of the game. And Niagara did a, a fantastic job leading up to that red card to where they wouldn't get. So where that game, the flow of the game changed in the Bobcats' favor, and they ended up winning that 4-0 goal, winning nope. that 4-0 game. I agree. This team, they have to play to their strengths, and one of their strengths is their depth. Mm. Like I said before, 10 players on all MAC teams. Now, to look at some, to highlight some of the players that they have, Golden Boot winner Rebecca Cook. Mm. 43 points, 18 goals, 5 game-winning goals. Also leading the MAC in shots on goal. That, that kind of skill doesn't just go around anywhere. You can't just find that on the street. Also, you mentioned yourself, Olivia Scott. She's a playmaker. She's a multi-tool. they got to play to their depth. Yeah, real quick, I just want to say, I did say the midfield was the issue, you know, a few weeks ago when I was last on Bobcat Breakdown, but I feel like ever since that episode, they've kind of have gotten a lot better in the midfield, which has been a help them. And I think that's why I kind of came to the conclusion that they would be playing in the second round in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I agree with both of you on this one. Flipping over to the men's side, they have clinched a top two spot in the MAC with a number one seed on the line when they play Niagara tomorrow afternoon. Should the Bobcats men's team carve up their opponent or go for the number one seed, or should they rest their starters in preparation for the tournament? Connor, you go. Yeah, I think this has to be... Quinnipiac has to come to this game and absolutely carve up Niagara and go for this one seed in the team. You know, clinching, if Iona wins as well, you know, they tied the, in the regular season this year, but they have to win this game and... Even if they, Iona does win the game in their last regular season against St. Peter's on Wednesday, they're still going to clinch that one seed. The team is 3-3-2 three, three, and two on the road and 8-0-1 and one at home. They're two completely different teams when it comes to on the road and at home. And I essentially, like I said, it's not two different teams. And it's, there's six first years that are consistently in the rotation for this team. And for their first MAC playoff experience, this game, this tournament has to run through Hamden. I know we talked about it in the pre-show a little bit, but and there's two, there's a world where two MAC championship games are played in Hamden, and that needs to happen for this men's team. And like I said, it's going to be helping them to get their experience up at those six first years, like Carl Netzel, like Jao Pinto, all those guys who've been ex extremely important to this Bobcats team this season. Now, Connor, you bring up some good points, but I actually disagree. I think they should go into this game resting their starters. Now, they already have, you know, they have a good spot clinched. you got to look at the calculated risk here. Mm. Their starters have gotten a lot of minutes. Mm. They've been playing the life out of them. They've run up and down, and that tends, that tends to wear the players out. And you don't want to wear your starters out too much, mm. especially leading into playoff, into the playoffs. Playoff, playoff soccer is a completely different game. The stakes are a lot higher. It's a lot more pressure. You want fresh feet on that field. And to look at that calculated risk, if – you don't play your starters, say you lose that game, you're not falling too far. It's not going to hurt you as much as it would if, you know, you're losing in the next game, if you're losing in the playoffs. Yeah, I think, like you said, obviously I disagree with you. Like they, There's a point in time where a lot of teams need to rest their players, and I think, like you said, the Bobcats have had an extremely amount of minutes with, you know, one through about you know 12 or 13 guys on this entire roster, but at sometimes when rest, it may hurt the team in the long run, and I feel like that might happen with this Eric DaCosta coach squad. You know, if you look at the max standings right now, it's Quinnipiac and Iona, and the, it doesn't matter if, this, like I said, this entire playoffs need to run through Hamden, and I feel like that needs to be the only option heading into this game tomorrow night against Niagara. All right, well, David, I'm going to have to disagree with you here. I'm going to go with Connor on this one. Last question of the block with the regular season coming to a close. How does the playoff picture look going into the playoffs for the MAC men's division? David, go. So, you know, I'm looking at this in the way that I see. 
take the calculator risk. You risk your starters, maybe you lose. I have Iona in the one spot. They're taking home field advantage there. Quinnipiac's going to fall down to two. Niagara, obviously with a big win, is going to go up to three. Siena at the four spot, Manhattan at five, and Fairfield at six. I think it is going to be a tight race, but it's a calculated risk. I think it's going to pay off in the long run. Yeah, my bracket's right there. You see at the top, I think Quinnipiac is going to take that one seed. And like I said, it obviously flows right into the question that we had previous. You mm -hmm. know, they, they have to get this one seed to run through Hamden. You know, I have Quinnipiac at the one, Iona at two, Manhattan at three. Siena and Fairfield I have interchangeably because, you know, Siena and Fairfield are playing each other tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. So whoever wins that game will end up in the four seed, and whoever loses that game will end up in the six seed. So they're going to eventually play each other, maybe even the semifinals. It could be a very good matchup there. But four, four through six is kind of where it's still up in the air, and I feel like one through three is, one through three is kind of going to be solidified for heading into the MAC playoffs as these last few regular season games happen tomorrow. Well, I definitely agree with you. Siena and Fairfield, that's going to be a good matchup. Mm -hmm. And four, four and six... Only time will tell. Only time can tell with this team and this entire conference. It's really, everything's up in the air, like I said, four through six. Yeah, um, I, again, I'm going to have to agree with Connor on this one. Uh, great debate so far, gentlemen, but I believe it is time to take our first break of the night. When we come back, we got all things women's hockey. See you in about two minutes. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. Studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. What? What? My. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, I'm your host, Anthony Rossi, alongside David Klepfer and Connor Core. No need for introductions this time around. Let's hit the ice and talk my favorite, hockey. David got the chance to sit down and talk with Lexi Agia, captain of the women's ice hockey team. Let's take a look at what she had to say. Roll it. Over the last four years, how has your relationship grown with head coach Cass Turner, especially donning the C for this year? Even thinking back to when I committed here, um, one of the reasons why I came here was because the coaching staff and Cass specifically, um, she has a really open door policy. And for me, she knows and knew then that I have a lot of goals I want to achieve, um, not just within this program, but also um, outside of Quinnipiac hockey. So I think just having that open relationship with her, um, doing lots of film, she's helped me grow and push me outside my comfort zone on the ice, but also as a person. Um, and I think that has helped me also become a better leader and take on that, that role this year. If you could give one piece of advice to 2018 Lexigia, what would it be? To enjoy the moment and be in the moment every day. 
Um, for me last year, I think I did that really well, but my first three years I didn't. And you, everybody tells you, oh, time goes by so fast, but you're like, no, it doesn't. It really does. Um, and for me, I wish I could rewind and be a freshman again. And even like I said before, on those hard days, just like stop for a second and be like, no, okay, it's a hard day, but I'm so lucky to be here. Um, and just really be in the moment every day. When we talked to you as a first year, we were asking you about your emotions after scoring your first goal. Now, 99 points later, you have become one of seven women Bobcats to join the 100 point club. Talk to me about the emotions and how you felt after scoring such an incredible milestone. I didn't know how close I was until my mom actually was like, hey, I think you're close to 100 points. Do you know where you're at? So I text Summer. I'm like, hey, like, am I close? And she's like, yeah. At that point, I was at 97, I believe. Um, so I tried not to focus on it too much. Obviously, it was in the back of my mind. I just knew it was going to come. Um, and only two of my Two of my teammates knew, one, Nina Stagoff knew I was really close, so she was super excited for me. And when I scored that goal against Harvard, it was a feeling of relief, but also just like a feeling of accomplishment. Um, yeah, just so, so such a special feeling. And if you look at those names that are up there, like Kelly Babstock, Melissa Samuskevich, who was my captain when I was a freshman, you know, to be a part of those names, it's really just an honor. And kind of, kind of felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders a little bit to kind of just get it. <laughs> Um, but again, I worked really, really hard for that. So it's a special feeling and an honor to be up there with all those, those names. With all that in mind, has Ajia been the most valuable player for the Bobcats? If not, who do you think has more impact on the team? David, you're going last. You know this team too much. Connor, hit it. Let's go. You know, with this team, you know, like no, no, all props to Lexi Ajia, excuse me, but I feel like the most important player for this team so far this season has to be grad student Shane Maloney. You know, first year on the team, has, was just named ECAC Forward of the Week today. You know, she served captain as senior at Brown, scoring 24 goals and 25 assists in her career. Already has six goals and seven assists this year. Highest ice plus minus rating on the team this year. And she didn't play her junior year because of COVID, and she very well could play another season for the Bobcats next year. So I feel like she's been the most important player for this Bobcat squad so far. And again, like I said, no disrespect to Lexi AG because she's been playing phenomenal. Obviously, she got her 100, 100th career point this season as well. A few things we agree on. One, Lexi AG, while a standout, I don't want to say she's the MVP. And two, that line, Mobley, Chandler, Maloney, it's their top producing offensive line. I think it's something in the air with number 15s at this school because obviously we know Jaden Lee's a bit of a rock star. I have to go with <laughs> Olivia Mobley. She's... So she's tied uh, for team leader in points. She mm -hmm. also has 13 along with Shea Maloney, th coming in at three goals and 10 assists. She's, she's the playmaker. She's the backbone of this line. Mm -hmm. Shea Maloney's not scoring as many goals if Olivia Mobley's not there because she's she has this ability to create opportunities out of absolutely nothing. She mm -hmm. takes junk plays and turns them into goals. And that's something that's truly invaluable. The way she has this self selfless play to her, it's just something you can't teach. Yeah, I think with Olivia Mobley specifically, you know, looking back on it last year, I think she ended the season with 34 points off the top of my head, if I'm not mistaken. Something but she's right. this entire year, she's had 10 assists and three goals, if I'm not, if I'm also not mistaken as well, Correct. throughout this entire season. So she's kind of been playing more, like you said, that selfless role. Where mm -hmm. last year she's kind of more of a goal scorer. It's kind of it's a nice little switch up, in my opinion, for. Um, Olivia Mobley, but you know, Shane Maloney has kind of had that adds the depth and experience to this team already that I feel like not was needed, but definitely helps to have Shane Maloney on this team. And I feel like she's going to be a powerhouse to look out for heading to the later parts of this ECAC season against a very, very competitive ECAC hockey conference. All right, well, two good players, but I'm going to have to agree on David with this one. With the Bobcats staying undefeated so far in this season, has their recent success this past weekend been due to the offense, defense, or goaltending? David, you're up, buddy. Well, I have to give it to the defense. They've been absolute standouts. Now, don't get me wrong. A team does not go undefeated for this long if they're not firing on all cylinders. Their forwards have been shooting the lights out of the puck, and the goalies have stopped nearly every puck that has come their way. But the D, they've got some shooters. Kate Riley had one of the biggest goals, and maybe the most important, maybe one of the biggest goals of the season. We'll have to see. But against number four Colgate, yes, that was a 3-0 game, but that does not tell the true story of what happened. It was 1-0 until two empty netters yeah. came, and that that early lead was huge. On top of that, 
the offense isn't going to be able to shoot as much if the puck's leaving the zone, going into defense, going deep. Then it's just you're not going to get the same. Uh, Logan Andres, she's been huge. She's taken the starting role, but she said it herself in a press conference. She's been so impressed with the sticks that this defense has. Even if she, she lets up very few rebounds, but if she does, the defense is right on it, getting that puck, clearing the zone. I think, you know, they say offense wins games, defense wins championships. Yeah, I have to agree with that. The defense wins championships. You've kind of you kind of talked about the defense, but I want to talk about the goalkeepers a little bit. I feel like they've had more of an impact than goaltending on goaltending than the defense has. You know, both Andres and Boudier have both had two shutouts this entire year separately, and over 150 saves both saved this entire season. Five of the top 15 shot blockers on this team this year have been from the defense. Kate Riley leading the team with nine. And the other shot blockers defensively have been from the offensive port. And in that 4-1 win against Cornell, there were many times in cases where Cornell should have scored against, Col- against Quinnipiac. But, you know, Logan Andres absolutely was an absolute rock star. You know, you mentioned Jaden Lee. I'd say, like, say Logan Andres is a rock star uh, in that game where they, Cornell very well could have been up, like, at three or four goals at that point, but absolutely robbed them from their goals. You know, we've talked about Andres being the number one. I feel like a lot of this case has turned into the similar situation that they had last year with Kareem Shorters and Logan Andres, where it was like a 1A and a 1B situation. Both teams, both goaltenders are playing extremely well. I think there really is no wrong answer with this, but I feel like the goaltending has had more of an advantage over the defense, only allowing .77 goals per game this season that's less than one so there's not going to be many times where teams are going to score against this against this defense and this goaltending more specifically now don't get me wrong a good goalie can take an average team make them a good team mm-hmm. but a good defense in front of a goalie that can take a good goalie and turn them into a great goalie that can make them give them the confidence to make those big saves because they don't have to make that many mm-hmm. and Cass Turner has said you know Logan Andres, she's not facing many, many shots. Kate, Kate Baudet, she's not facing many. Mm-hmm. If we look at uh, the game against St. Anselm, seven shots total. So yeah. I just I have to give the credit to the defense. Yeah, Logan Andres did make 24 saves against Cornell, against a very good Cornell side as well. So I feel like it comes with what the competition they're going to be playing. So. All right, I am going to agree with Connor on this one. I feel like the goalies have been given too much. Rounding out the questions, I want to go back to this Halloween theme we got going. What team is going to be the most frightening on campus this year? Connor, who is the most scariest team on campus? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a team that hasn't really stepped onto the, onto the court yet this season. It has to be the Quinnipiac women's basketball team, in my opinion. And, you know, in the first four games this entire season, they're going to be playing two top 15 teams in the entire nation in NC State, which will open up against at NC State and at Indiana as well. Last year, some of you may know that Indiana was – on the ropes for quite a while against Quinnipiac, leading going into halftime only by one or two points. You know, Trish, Trish Fabry could, could possibly get, and honestly probably will get, her 500th career win in this season very well. And they have a lot of key roster pieces coming back and bringing in from the transfer portal. They have the 2020 MAC Player of the Year, Mackenzie Deweese, an all-MAC second team forward in Michaela Morris, an all-MAC rookie teamer, Jackie Grisno, just to name a few. They also brought in Mary Baskerville, who transferred from Providence after graduating after four years, won 2019 Big East Rookie of the Year, and graduated from Providence with over 1,000 points, over 700 rebounds, and over 175 block shots. That's impressive for a team. Just be able to add that, add Mary Bakersville specifically, this brings a lot of different elements to the team, and they're extremely tall. I think they have four or five players who are over 6'2 and 6'3, which is extremely beneficial for a small conference like the MAC to be able to take that to an NCAA tournament. Now, I think the scariest team that, we've, that we're going to see all year, I think they're skating right now. I have to go with the women's hockey team. Call me a bit of a homer. But if we take a look back to last year, there were some big shoes to fill in Kareen Schroeder and Taylor House leaving. Mm-hmm. The team has stepped up in massive ways. Lexi Agia has filled that scoring spot, and Logan Andres has filled those shoes that Green Schroeder left, and then some. There's also been some great first-year additions. Madison Chandler scoring a hat-trick in your first-ever home game. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. And Zoe Ewens, you know, not many points, but a staple on the team. Mm. Uh, This team is relentless. They're having another undefeated season, and they don't let up ever. They don't play down to teams. They, don't, they know who they are, and they stick to that. St. Anselm, 65 shots, shots for QU. Mm. St. Anselm only got seven. Yeah, like you look you at the big game, Colgate, fourth in the country, and they looked like it. They're, they're, they have a very good power play, very offensive team. Yeah. Against Colgate, they really couldn't get a very successful game. 
um, they couldn't get a very successful power play going. Um, yeah. But with that, they wouldn't let up. They keep going, and quite simply, they got that dog in them. Yeah, I agree with David on this one. Call me a bit of a homework too, but ooh, it's getting hot in here. Or was it just the debate heating up? It's time to cool down and we take our final break of the evening. When we return, we talk about the QBSN Game of the Week and, of course, Final Roars. Be back in a flash. I don't think that many kids in my son's school even do it. He makes fun of his friend who vapes. He would never try it. She's in the sock. She's on the honor roll. She's just on the tape. No way. No way. No way. No way. My kid would never vape. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping. Maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. Type 2 diabetes can have a big impact on your life, but how can it be prevented? Well, the first step is knowing if you have prediabetes, a serious medical condition that puts you at high risk for type 2 diabetes. One in three American adults has prediabetes, but more than 80% don't know they have it. The good news is, prediabetes can be reversed, and for many people, healthy changes in their daily routine can make a big difference. Take the one-minute risk test today at doihaveprediabetes.org. Meet the scan, a simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. I'm here to save you. But I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at SaveByTheScan.org. I think it's just vapor with flavor. It won't hurt my kid like cigarettes, right? Vaping is safer than smoking, isn't it? There's really not even that much nicotine in them, right? My kid? My kid, my kid knows it's dangerous. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping, maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. Thank you for sticking with us. It's time for the QBSN Game of the Week. The Quinnipiac Bobcats played Colgate this weekend, the number four ranked team in the country, and they won in three to nothing shutout fashion. Logan Andres had 25 saves in the win, and the goals were scored by Kate Riley, Olivia Mobley, and Shay Maloney. Logan Andres capped off this evening with first star of the game. The Bobcats head to New Haven to take on Yale next, and they play Rhode Island on Saturday. It's time for everybody's favorite time of the night, Final Roars. David, let's start off with you. Now, one of the scariest things a student can do is put themselves out there. It's intimidating to walk into a room where everyone seems to know each other and you don't know anyone's name. Remember, everyone seems to know what they're doing to be a part of the production that are these shows. It can be just as intimidating to apply for positions within the station as well as trying new positions on shows. So many of us put it off until we think we missed our opportunity. I can promise you it is never too late. I thought it was too late to spend a semester in LA, but I found I was able to go and I searched the internet until I did. I started my first beat as a grad student and I have never been on the desk for a show until tonight. Trying new things can be terrifying, especially when you feel like you've missed out on an opportunity. There's no such thing as too late. I know how hard it can be to push past the anxiety and start from the bottom when the people teaching you can be the same age or even younger. But I promise you, once you put yourself out there, you will be mad you haven't done it sooner. Winter is coming, and no, this is not Game of Thrones. Men's and women's hockey are neck deep in their season, but the basketball teams are just gearing up for their season. While Trish Fabry and the women's hockey team are, and the women's basketball team are trying to make it back to the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2018-19 season, in the other locker room, there's a lot more up in the air. The men's basketball team had one of their biggest roster turnovers in recent memory. Losing four players to the transfer portal allowed four new players to make their Bobcat debut this season. Eliza Taylor will have to wait until next season to make his debut due to a season and injury. Alexis Reyes, Ike Nueke, and Paul Otieno are all above 6 foot 7 inches and add much needed height to this roster. Alongside first and third team All-Max selections Matt Belanc and Desi Jones, this team could surprise some people this season. This also is head coach Baker Dunleavy's second team that have ever been recruited just by him. While things may be up in the air, this team has shown the heart and attitude to compete with anyone no matter how high the odds are stacked against them. 
while Iona and Manhattan appear to be sitting on their iron throne with ease. I'll call me crazy, but this team could surprise some Bobcat squad climb to the crown MAC champions. Well, sadly, this is going to have to do it for this episode of Bobcat Breakdown. Make sure to tune in next time at q30tv.com backslash watch. Download the Q30 TV app on all app stores and make sure to check out our website so you never miss out another episode. From the producers to everyone behind the scenes, for David and Connor, I'm Anthony Rossi. See you guys next time.